everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is Flora Delargy. I'm an author and illustrator from Belfast, and I'd love to tell you all a little bit about my book, um, which is called Rescuing Titanic. Um, and I'd also like to read some of the book to you as well. Um, this is the story of what happened over 100 years ago when a little ship called the Carpathia came to the rescue of the biggest and most famous ship in the world, which was called the Titanic. Um, so for those of you who don't know, the Titanic was built here in Belfast, where I live, um, back in 1912 and took three whole years to be constructed and over 15,000 people worked on it, um, all with different jobs. There were naval architects who designed the ship, draftsmen um, who made drawings and plans of the ship, um, carpenters who made the staircases. So all sorts of people were involved in making this enormous ship. Um, my great granddad, actually, George Smith, worked in another shipyard just across the lock from where Titanic was being constructed. And my granddad, who I've got a picture of here, his name is William Smith. That's he, him on the left there, if you can see. Um, he became a naval architect in the 1950s. And uh, later he worked for the company that built the Titanic. Um, so as you may know, Titanic started its first journey in April 1912. Um, and after calling in at Cove, it headed to New York with over 2,000 people on board. Um, and those traveling first class were some of the wealthiest and most famous people in the, in the entire world. Um, many people in second, third class were um, off to begin a new life in America as well. So it was sort of an exciting and a momentous journey for everybody on board. Um, meanwhile, another ship had been sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, but in the opposite direction. Um, the Carp Carpathia was much smaller and far less glamorous than the Titanic. And it had been quietly making its own way, um, its own journey, really taking passengers from America to the Mediterranean. And no one had really paid um, an awful lot of attention to it as it went about its business, um, just sort of slowly and calmly and predictably um, on what was called the Southern Atlantic route. So um, things actually really couldn't have been more different further north on the Titanic. Um, and I'd now like to read directly from the book for you. So, night falls on the Titanic. Lookouts in the crow's nest had spotted an iceberg. They raised the alarm and the first officer Murdoch issued orders for the ship to veer left and the engines to be thrust into reverse. It wasn't enough and the largest ocean liner in the world struck the iceberg on her starboard side. Water began to flood in through a tear, several tears in her hull. The Titanic's Captain Smith was alerted by the commotion and almost immediately arrived on the bridge. He instructed 4th Officer Boxall to commission a thorough inspection of the ship. Despite closing the watertight doors in the first 10 minutes, five forward compartments had flooded. This was one too many to allow her to stay afloat. After assessing the damage, the ship's Belfast engineer, Thomas Andrews, told Captain Smith the ship would sink within 90 minutes. All over 2,220 passengers and crew we're now in great danger. The Titanic calls for help. Boxall went to the chart room to calculate the ship's position. He determined it to be 41 degrees 46 north, 50 degrees 14 west. Captain Smith told him to pass the information to the radio officers. From the Marconi wireless room, Jack Phillips and Harold Bride began frantically sending out signals to as many ships as they could. Three letters CQD indicated the international distress call. CQ indicated it was a call to all ships, while D signaled distress. The two men also sent out the new SOS distress call and joked it would probably be their last chance to use it. CQD, CQD, Titanic to all ships. What's the matter with you, said the Frankfurt to Titanic. We've struck an iceberg and sinking. Please tell the captain to come. OK, we'll tell the bridge right away. Titanic to Olympic. Sinking head down. Come as soon as possible. Captain says, get your boats ready. What is your position? Olympic to Titanic. Are you steering southerly to meet us? Titanic to Olympic. We are putting the women off in boats. Cannot last much longer. Olympic to Titanic. I'm lighting up all possible boilers as fast as can. Titanic picked up by the Baltic, engine room getting flooded. Baltic to Titanic, we are rushing to you. So it was now 40 minutes since the Titanic had hit the iceberg and many of its first class passengers 
had gathered in the lounge with their life belts. Many struggled to believe the ship, which had been called unsinkable, could truly be in danger. Some of the passengers moved out onto deck. The musicians followed and continued to entertain the crowds. So as you can see here, it's about 20 past midnight at this point. Carpathia receives an SOS. Back on board the Carpathia, it was just after midnight. Cotton, this is Harold Cotton here. He was the, um, the Carpathia's only wireless officer. Um, Cotton was preparing to finish his shift. He'd been waiting up to hear a response to a message he had sent early that, earlier that day. After deciding he had hung on long enough, he remembered a wireless station on Cape Cod had messages for the Titanic. Good morning, old man. Do you know there are messages for you at Cape Race? Carpathia said to the Titanic. Come at once, we've struck a berg. It's a CQD, old man, said the Titanic to Carpathia. Stunned, caught him now sharply awake, tapped out a reply. Shall I tell my captain, do you require assistance? An answer quickly came. Yes, come quick, said the Titanic to the Carpathia. Cotton ripped off his headphones, grabbed the sheet of paper bearing the message and ran to the officer on duty, First Officer Dean, and explained what had happened. Without hesitation, both men rushed to Rostrum's cabin. As you can see here, there's the message from, from Harold Cotton. It says, CQD require assistance, um, struck iceberg from the Titanic. Cotton and Dean charged down the corridor and went hurtling into the captain's cabin without knocking. Before Captain Rostrum could even respond, Dean uttered words he would never forget. Captain, we've just received an urgent distress message from Titanic. She has struck an iceberg and requires immediate assistance. Her position is 41 degrees 46 north, 50 uh, degrees 14 west. Are you absolutely sure? Yes, sir. Captain Rostrum's mind was clear as he thought. He ordered Dean to return to the bridge and, and turn the ship around. At 58 nautical miles from the Titanic's reported location, um, at her customary top speed of 14 knots, it would take the Carpathia at least four long, agonizing hours to reach the sinking ship. They had to go faster. Action stations. Captain Rostron roused his crew to action. All hands were needed for the race to the Titanic and the rescue of its survivors. But as the Carpathia prepared to bravely forge a path through an ice-strewn sea, the captain was only too aware of the dangers ahead. So I think we'll pause at this point. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so there were there were lots of preparations made um, aboard the Carpathia. They they got lifeboats ready in case they needed them for the survivors. Um, electric lights were set up at each gangway and draped over the side. Um, Additional lookouts were stationed throughout the ship to look for ice or, or flares from other ships. And below deck, um, dining rooms were converted to hospital wards. Uh, blankets and um, hot drinks were prepared for the survivors and engineers worked very hard to wring every ounce of steam from the boilers. So they made sure that the, um, the, uh, all the heating was turned off so all that steam could be diverted to the, to the boilers um, to push the ship forward. Um, so meanwhile, though, Titanic was taking on water and the decision was made to launch the lifeboats, only, which could only hold about half of the people on board. Um, at the same time, Carpathia was powering through the ice fields, um, desperate to try and reach the Titanic's um, last reported location. So at this point, I think we'll just return to the book. Carpathia reached Titanic's last reported location at 4 a.m. Captain Rostron stopped the engines. He felt proud that his crew and his ship had done everything he had asked of them. They had worked tirelessly through the night, spurred on by the thought of those in peril. Captain Rostron also felt an increasing sense of hopelessness. Despite their best efforts, the mighty ship was nowhere to be seen. The last communication they had received from Phillips and Bride was over two hours ago. They were too late. Under that moonless sky sprinkled with stars, Captain Rostron and his crew felt very alone. Suddenly, they saw a pale glow not far ahead and low in the water. The captain and his crew sprang to action and approached Titanic's lifeboat number two. 
only narrowly avoiding collision with, a, with an iceberg as they did so. Bissett and two seamen climbed down the rope ladders and jumped aboard to help the survivors onto the Carpathia. As the first survivors came aboard, Captain Rostron learned that the Titanic had sunk completely at 2.20 a.m. There was no time to lament. They must do all they could for Titanic survivors. The sun was beginning to rise, revealing the rest of Titanic's lifeboats which bobbed nearby. The sunrise also revealed horrifying lumps of ice stretching as far as the eye, the eye could see. They continued to pick their way carefully through the icebergs, gradually picking up all of Titanic survivors from 18 lifeboats. A number of passengers were able to climb up rope ladders draped down the side of the, of the Carpathia, while others were hoisted up with slings or chairs, as you can see in the picture here. Children were placed into canvas sacks and winched aboard. In all, 706 passengers and crew survived the sinking. Incredibly, 25 men kept alive by climbing on top of the Titanic's upturned collapsible boat B. Among them was Harold Bride. He was Titanic's own wireless officer. They stayed there until daybreak when, uh, when they transferred to one of the lifeboats. So it was incredible, these guys just standing on top of the, on top of the upturned collapsible boat, you know, swaying with the motion of the sea. So it was um, very dangerous and, uh, and they, must, they must have been absolutely exhausted. By 8.30 a.m., all the survivors had been rescued from the water. So here are some of the passengers from the Titanic arriving on the Carpathia and being tended to by the Carpathia's crew. Monday, 15th of April, making sense of a tragedy. Captain Rostron and his crew were struck by the immense quietness of the traumatized survivors as they came aboard Carpathia. The crew helped survivors out of their life belts. Stewards ushered them to the makeshift hospital wards and gave out blankets and hot drinks. Soon after the survivors boarded the Carpathia, the officers compiled a list of their names, a task which took most of the day. The Carpathia's passengers did all they could for the survivors. They gave them clothes and several, such as Colin and Emma Campbell Cooper, made room for the survivors in their cabins. Most importantly, the Carpathia's passengers did, all, did their best to console the survivors and help encourage those overcome with grief to eat and drink a little. Later in that day, a memorial service was held in the ship's first class dining saloon for those who had perished. So that is really the story of the Carpathia. Um, I think you'll all agree, it's a tale of great tragedy, but also one of great bravery. Um, I hope you enjoyed hearing about it and thank you all for taking the time to read along with me. Um, I just wanted to thank the Department of Foreign Affairs for organizing this fantastic initiative. And I suppose all that remains is for me to wish you all a very happy Christmas. Thank you for listening.